Welcome to Peer to Peer, the podcast, brought to you by Raina. Listen in as we hear from top surgeons having great conversations with their peers about hot and popular topics in ophthalmology. In this episode, Mr. Alon Barsom sits down with Purvi Thompson and Kiva McGovern to discuss the importance of both preoperative and postoperative management of dry eye disease and the impact it can have on biometry, visual outcomes, and ultimately patient satisfaction. Mr. Alon Barsom is a director and founding partner of OCL Vision and recognised internationally as an expert and key opinion leader for cataract and refractive surgery. Huavi Thompson is a lead optometrist at OCL Vision in London, where she utilises her expertise and specialist training to deal with various eye conditions, including dry eye disease. Kiva McGovern is a specialist optometrist at OCL Vision, where she carries out preoperative assessments and post-operative consultations for refractive and cataract surgery patients. Welcome to another peer-to-peer podcast hosted by Rayner. I'm your host, Alon Barson. In today's episode, we're going to dive into dry eye disease, and who better to discuss this than the top optometrists treating patients day in and day out. I'm going to be speaking with two of my colleagues from OCL Vision, Puravi Thompson and Kiva McGovern, about the importance of both preoperative and postoperative management of dry eye disease, the impact it can have on biometry, visual outcomes, and ultimately patient satisfaction. Welcome both. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. So just to start off with, can start with either of you, maybe Puravi, could you just tell us a little bit about your role at OCL Vision? As optometrists, our role is to work alongside the ophthalmologist during an initial consultation where we do a thorough history and symptoms, a refractive workup for all patients, um, and also an interior eye and tear film assessment. We also carry out the subsequent follow-ups post-surgery. And together with this, we also run an optometric-led dry eye clinic where we are lucky enough to be able to use the latest technology, including IPL therapy. Thanks very much. And Kiva, could you just tell us a little bit about what a normal day looks like for you in terms of your assessment of patients? Uh, Yeah, sure. So a normal day, it's typically either spent doing consultations with the consultant ophthalmologists or doing the post-operative care. Most of our patients that we see at OCL Vision are for refractive surgery, whether this is laser eye surgery, uh, refractive lens exchange, or for cataract surgery. So we typically will see the patients after they have had their scans done. We will then see the patients, delve into why they have come to see us, and we will then do a full workup. So we will do a refraction. um, And then, as Purvi said, we also assess the anterior eye. Uh, We can generally elicit from this um, patients who are going to be our dry eye candidates. Um, So we're always keeping an ear out for that. Um, We will then hand them over to the consultants and essentially brief the consultants on what we have found and give our recommendation as to to what we feel the patient is here to see us for. Then we would be doing our post-operative care for patients. We're managing any post-operative complications that may arise and generally thankfully at OCL Vision looking after very happy patients. Fantastic so you guys are busy working patients up before and after surgery and dealing with any issues that may arise in between. Puravi could you explain a little bit to the listeners what is dry eye disease and what and how the symptoms manifest? Yes of course so for those of us who are interested in dry eye disease I think we all would have heard the TFOS Jews 2 classification um, of dry eye, which is that it's a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface, characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film. This classification also goes on to explain that it's accompanied by ocular symptoms of which the etiology can be linked to, let's say, tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage and neurosensory abnormality. So Obviously, that's quite a long statement for something that a lot of clinicians may pass off as simple dry eye. But essentially, it is a disease where many factors can play a role, resulting in very problematic symptoms for our patients, which, from a surgical point of view, can have a huge impact on our outcomes and obviously patient satisfaction. 
So for patients that walk into our clinic, what symptoms will they have? Well, we all probably would have heard the the classic symptoms. I've got gritty, sore, burning eyes, they look red, and some patients even say that they water. Um, And often patients complain of pain and fluctuating vision, and in severe situations, it can be very debilitating. Thank you. Um, Kiva, could you give, give us an idea of how common you feel dry eye disease is in cataract and refractive patients? So I would say, you know, nearly 75% of patients that walk through our door definitely have evidence of, of dry eye, whether they know about it or not. Um, a lot of patients, I guess, have got the symptoms of dry eye and tell them to you during the history taken, but they don't actually realize that that, would, that is what dry eye is. Um, I think it's it's very important to then speak to these patients who aren't actually aware that they have pre-existing dry eye and to tell them that that is there and that it can be exacerbated by having ocular sur- surgery. And um, so that just allows for better, I guess, adherence to management post-surgery and for their understanding of why their eyes are feeling the way they are. Um, for your refractive surgery patients, again, very, very common. Um, I feel that nowadays there is very few patients who probably enter into a clinic without dry eye simply because of contact lens use. Um, Many patients who wear contact lenses wear them seven days a week, 12 hours a day, and that will exacerbate dry eye. Um, So on the whole, there is a huge percentage of our patients who walk into the clinic with dry eye. Kiva, you make a good point. Like you said, patients come in and they may not complain of any dry disease yet we look at their ocular surface and it's and it's really poor and you think wow well, you've got classic dry eye disease and you've got zero symptoms and then likewise you have the other patients who come in and and they tell us their eyes are gritty and they burn and they don't feel right and you look at their front of the eye and actually the ocular surface isn't too bad so um and i think you're right the majority of our patients especially the cataract patients you know do present with evidence of dry eye disease purely because because of their age and and their aging that causes that the change in morphology of the lid structure, the meibomian glands, the reduction in lacrimal secretion. So lots of factors in play there. Yeah, I think you both made an excellent point so far, n- namely that, that obviously these conditions are very common amongst the population of patients we treat, but also that there are environmental factors that can that can play a role and exacerbate things. And Kiva just made one point that I really want to pick up on and highlight, which because I, I think it's so key which is this idea of how important it is to tell patients preoperatively if they have dry eye. And obviously that's important to help them manage it and because we may advise management, but more so because as Keith has also mentioned that we may exacerbate dry eye with some of the surgery that we do. And if they're not made aware of the fact that there's a problem before, they will always assume that the surgery has caused a problem when it may be pre-existing. Purvi, why is it important to treat dry eye disease before surgery? Why is it so important in your opinion? I mean, it's well known that uh, poor tear film does result in unfavourable surgical outcomes. Um, and I think this is more important. This is more of an important factor considering that patient expectations are so high, um, especially with regards to spectacle independence. So with the poor tear film, you can get an inc- incorrect amplitude and axis of astigmatism that will then result in an incorrect choice of IOL power, which then becomes a refractive surprise post-op and then in short, patient dissatisfaction. We want to be able to provide the best choice of lenses for our patients. Um, so if they're presenting with dry eye, dry eye and they've got a higher order aberrations, for example, due to their tear film, we may discount certain lenses. Alan. I know that we look at topographies and we'll say, look, the aberrations are quite high here. Let's perhaps steer away from a trifocal or, or a multifocal. And for some patients, they are really insistent that they want to have these kind of lenses. So I know you found that when we send patients away and we treat their dry, dry eye and then bring them back into clinic and recheck their topographies and the biometry, the front of the eye, actually, they're, they're absolutely fine to be able to have some of these prima IOLs. Can you talk a bit about what the treatments are? Yeah, of course. So I guess it depends on the severity of their dry eye disease. So it can just be the simple factor of actually what we need to do is give you some artificial tears to use. And, you know, not one drop works for all. So if someone presents with mild to moderate dry eye disease, you might say, try this eye drops. There are various, a few that work pretty well. I mean, we tend to use preservative-free and phosphate-free. 
Um, I know Aeon do a great pre and post surgery eye drop is cross linked, which is which is great for the eye. So we often send them away to use to use lubricating drops. We ask them to do a warm compress to open up the meibomian glands, release release the oils, get better secretions from them. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're lucky at OCL, we do have access to latest technology. So I know at times we have performed IPL pre-surgery just to get the glands function a bit better or done a blephex treatment or a new lids treatment just to get their blepharitis under control. And when things like this don't work, you know, we can resort to, to medications, you know, steroids or cyclosporine that we ask them to take beforehand and ask them to carry on post-surgery and more plus or minus antibiotic drugs. Kiva, can you talk a bit about the about post-surgery dry eye disease, um, how it manifests and what what you do to manage it, if anything, you know, in terms of anything different? Sure. So we do have, um, for the first six weeks post-surgery, we do advise all our patients as a bare minimum to be using uh, lubricants four times a day, but that is the bare minimum. Um, You know, you can use these lubricants, especially if they're preservative-free, up to every hour post-surgery. Um, it really aids the recovery of the front of the eye. Um, and as Purvi spoke about, one of the eye drops that we do highly recommend at uh, OCL Vision is the Aeon Protect Plus, which is cross-linked. So the brilliant thing about that is that it retains more water. So that enhances the lubrication at the front of the eye. So a drop such as the Aeon Protect Plus, using that at that frequency um, for the first six weeks post-surgery is fantastic. Other things that we can do, um, you know, I typically ask patients when do they notice that their eyes are most symptomatic and that gives you like really key clues as to how to manage these patients. So, for example, if patients say, oh, it's first thing in the morning, you know, I can't open my eyes, they're burning and my vision's very, very blurred in the morning. That like tells me, okay, this patient needs to use an ointment before bed because their eyes are obviously drying out whilst they're sleeping. Um, if they're saying it's during their working day, then I know, OK, they're using screens. They need to get up, walk away from their screen, take regular breaks, blink more. Um, always looking at their eyelids, looking at their, as um, Purvi said, their oil secretion. Um, and then if after, generally we'll leave them, um, if they're presented with significant signs, probably no longer than six weeks, and then we'll reassess. And if there is you know, still significant signs of dryness there, then we're going to have to think of changing the management plan. So that is when your steroids become uh, quite beneficial. Um, But I would say for the majority of patients um, with simple lubrication, um, they they tend to make a really good recovery. Do you think, Kiva, it's because we've assessed them beforehand so vigorously and we've picked out the patients that are actually going to struggle post-operatively with dry eye? that we tend to avoid the lenses that may cause them more dissatisfaction. But those patients that come in post-op that do have dry eye actually are still very happy with their vision. I think so, yeah. I think we have now, I, I guess you, you, it's, there's a learning curve in it um, when, when you introduce these lenses, but I think for, for trifocal lenses, to be truthfully honest, patients with significant dry eye are not good candidates for them. If they've got a very poor tear breakup time, they're just not going to be well suited to a trifocal lens. And we do tend to now use other premium IOLs, such as your EDOF lenses that work fantastically well in these patients, even if they do have a reduced tear breakup time. So I totally agree. It tends to be more in that case than symptoms of comfort as opposed to vision quality. I was just going to say, I agree. I totally agree with that. I think that the, 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 trifocal or the kind of let's say full presbyopia correcting type intraocular lenses are very demanding on optical quality and someone that is likely to have a pervasively poor tear film um you know that that's a really common reason of dissatisfaction with those lenses Raina has a couple of different a on eye drops and we've spoken a little bit about the benefit of cross-linked Purvi, do you have a favorite one do you have any advice on at what stages of the patient pathway which one should be should be used could you just talk us and the listeners through a little bit about the the range of drops and when you might use one rather than another. I think we're very lucky at OCL that we do have a range of eye drops that we can use. Um, the pre and post op Aeon is fantastic. Um, like Kiva mentioned, it is cross link. It retains more water. Um, it has an increased viscoelastic 
elasticity and so it sits longer on the eye. So pre and post surgery, this is a fantastic drop. The Aeon Repair um, is also great. So it has a vitamin A and E, both of which have a protecting nourishing factor, protects against free radicals, oxidative stress. So these drops are fantastic post surgery just to help in that additional healing. Um, but again, not all drops suit suit everyone. So the pe patients do have a separate preference. I have a, a few patients, which is very rare, that just don't get on with anything that's sodium hyaluronate based in it. It's very, very rare. But they'll come in and think, every time I put this drop in, I just don't like it. So we'll swap them over to a different type of drop completely, a carboma, something else. And, and actually, they're a lot happier. Um, so it depends on what we're finding is the root cause. But for the majority of the patients, probably about 95 to 98% of the patients, Sodium hyaluronate, crosslink, um, added vitamins, it's, it's a great drop to have. Fantastic. Thanks so much. It's just fascinating to have this discussion and realise how much of the work that we do in refractive cataract surgery, refractive surgery um, and intraocular surgery is influenced to some extent by the patient's ocular surface uh, and whether they have a problem and how we manage it. Um, I'd just like to thank... Purvi and Kiva for your time and for your insight and the work that you do managing these patients is so critical as, as, as we've already said to the, to the outcomes that we can achieve in terms of um, choosing the right lens for the patient in terms of the accuracy of the, the lenses that we choose in terms of treating the right refraction when it comes to laser or lens-based refractive uh, and then managing patients afterwards so that they're happy um, and heal in a normal and uncomplicated fashion so thank you for your time in the discussion and thank you for all of the excellent work that you do for ocl vision both of you thanks very much alan thanks alan rainus aeon eye drops is specifically designed to support the management of dry eye disease before and after eye surgery for more information about the availability of aeon eye drops in your country please speak to your local Rayna representative Join us for the next episode of Peer to Peer, the podcast, where we welcome a new set of surgeons and explore another hot topic in ophthalmology. For more information about this episode's topic and to read the show notes, visit the Peer to Peer hub at rainer.com forward slash peer to peer. This podcast is provided for general information purposes only. The presenter's views are their own. Rayner does not endorse off-label use. Users must refer to the product labelling and instructions for use for Rayner products in all cases. Not all Rayner products are available in all countries. The full disclaimer can be found in the show notes.